Enterprise here in Washington, D.C., and the Jewish Virtual Library. I'm the author of the forthcoming book, The Arab Lobby. I'm pleased to moderate this historic event with author Edwin Black regarding the 25th anniversary edition of his very first book, The Transfer Agreement, the dramatic story of the pact between the Third Reich and Jewish Palestine. This book chronicles the painful deal made between the Zionists and the Nazis that saved lives and assets by transferring some 60,000 European Jews with about $1.4 billion of their assets to Jewish Palestine in a very complex arrangement called the Transfer Agreement. First, a word about Edwin Black. Edwin is an award-winning New York Times and international investigative author of 69 best-selling editions in 14 languages in 61 countries, as well as scores of newspaper and magazine articles in the leading publications of the United States, Europe, and Israel. With more than a million books in print, his work focuses on genocide and hate, corporate criminality and corruption, governmental misconduct, academic fraud, philanthropic abuse, oil addiction, alternative energy, and historical investigation. Editors have submitted Black's work ten times for Pulitzer Prize nominations, and in recent years he has been the recipient of a series of top editorial awards. His works have been the subject of numerous documentaries here and abroad. All of his books have been optioned by Hollywood for film with three in active production. I understand that Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise are competing to play you in the films. Black speaking tours include hundreds of events in dozens of cities each year, appearing at prestigious venues from the Library of Congress in Washington, and the Simon Wiesenthal Institute in Los Angeles in America, and in Europe from London's British War Museum to Amsterdam's Institute for War Documentation. He is the editor of the Cutting Edge News, which receives more than <coughs> 1.5 million visits each month. Black's eight award-winning best-selling books are IBM and the Holocaust, War Against the Week, which now is a movie of the same name, Banking on Baghdad, two books on oil addiction, Internal Combustion and the Plan, and the book which came out earlier this year, Nazi Nexus, as well as a novel, Format C. But his first book was The Transfer Agreement, originally published by Macmillan in 1984, and now out in a 25th anniversary edition, with a new author's introduction and an afterword by Abraham Foxman, the national director of the Anti-Defamation League. A reviewer for Yad Vashem called the book Striking in Scope. A reviewer for Simon Wiesenthal's Institute called it Spellbinding. The book won the Carl Sandburg Award for the best book of the year. Googling this controversial book yields more than a million different entries. It's discussed and cited every day by those who cherish the memory of the six million in the state of Israel and those who use the book to deny the Holocaust and delegitimize the Jewish state. Although the author has scores of public appearances, this is Edwin Black's only event on the transfer agreement. First, he will be interviewed by Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt of Congregation B'nai Tzedek, then questions. The questioning has been opened up to scholars, historians, and ordinary readers worldwide by a variety of modalities, including advance notices and articles in History News Network and the Cutting Edge News. I will read the questions. Now I present Rabbi Stuart Weinblatt. Thank you, Mitchell. So we're here with Edwin Black. and. Uh, uh, most, most people know you for some of the bestsellers, some of the books that uh, Mitchell has just referred to. IBM, The Holocaust, War Against the Weak, Internal Combustion, Banking on Baghdad. All of these books, bestsellers, were written, however, in the 21st century. Um, you have, I understand, somewhere around 69 different editions, uh, published in about 14 languages in 61 countries. The question that we're focusing on today was actually your first book called The Transfer Agreement, the dramatic story of the pact between the Third Reich and Jewish Palestine. This book was published in 1984, so it's been 25 years ago. Um, and at the time that it came out, I remember there was a tremendous amount of uh, media attention, and also it was a very controversial book. It was uh, one that there was a tremendous amount of discussion about it, and so that's really what brings us here today. Um, 
can you let's go first to that issue what was it about the publication of this book and the, the, the thesis that you were putting forth what was it that garnered so much attention and so much controversy the story of the transfer agreement is the story of the pact between the Zionists and the Nazis that was uh, launched uh, in the first weeks of the Third Reich in 1933. Uh, it began uh, in the spring of 1933 and was consummated in uh, August of 1933. Most people don't know that when Hitler came to power, the Jews actually fought back, and they fought back hard, and they fought back immediately. Uh, Hitler came to power on January 30th, 1933. The first concentration camp was uh, actually on, uh, opened up a, a, a series of them between March 8th and March 10th of 1933. The anti-Jewish laws followed shortly thereafter. And by March 27th of 1933, the Jewish war veterans uh, had actually um, started uh, a series of international protests and, mar and marches. And on March 27th of 1933, one million protesters jammed Madison Square Garden and there were uh, uh, boycott and protest movements all over the globe led by the Jews but certainly involving um, the uh, interfaith community, the labor unions, anyone who wanted to profit at Germany's expense and to protest the Nazi regime. So we're talking this is about 10, 12 years before the onset of, of, onset of, of, of uh, World War II. Uh, 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 World War II began at 6 a.m. on uh, uh, September 30th, 30. 1939. So, right, right. so we're talking, uh, Hitler came to power in 33, the Nuremberg Laws in 35, uh, Kristallnacht in 1938, the war in 1939, and most of the genocidal uh, period, the so-called final solution, I guess, would have begun in the summer of 1941, the fall of, nine, of, nine, of 1941, and then commencing at full speed in 1943, 4, and 5. Um, so what the Zionists did was they realized that protest was fruitless. Let's take a moment. Let's be sure we define the Zionists. Those are the people who, what were they doing? The Zionists, I believe that most people don't know what the word Zionism so let's, means. Let's start with that. Well, at the end of the uh, 19th century, there were a number of nationalistic movements across Europe. There was uh, the concept of Armenian nationalism, there was uh, East European nationalism, the Ottoman Empire was falling apart. There was a wide group of people who were uh, seeking to self-govern. To, to self One of these many groups was the uh, Jewish pe was the Jewish pe uh, Jewish people, and Zionism is nothing more than Jewish nationalism. So the, we're talking the Jewish nationalists, the Jewish nationalists, okay. the Zionists, seeking to legally uh, uh, organize themselves into a state under international law, which was done through the League of Nations. Okay. Um, sought to uh, move the Jews who were persecuted, especially in Europe into Jewish Palestine. Most people t today think of Palestinians as Arabs, but the entire world mm -hmm. in 1933 thought the word Palestinian meant Jewish Referred nationalist, the Jews, right. Zionist, the Jewish Agency for Palestine, the Palestine Post, Jewish Palestine. That's why the subtitle of the book is Jewish Palestine, be, sure. because that was the body of the Jews in what, what became the State of Israel. It was called Jewish Palestine, and the term for the Jews, internationally recognized in ordinary parlance and officially, was Palestinian. Palestinians. So they used to refer to Jews as, Pal as Palestinians. So these Zionists, who were the advocates then for a Jewish homeland, pick up our story in terms of the They controversy. saw the end before anyone saw the end. Mm -hmm. And they said, the only thing that we can do to save a remnant, because they saw it coming, they knew the history of the Jews, the recent history and the distant history, they saw it coming, and they made a deal with the Reich to transfer out the Jews of Nazi Germany and other parts of Europe into Palestine. Now, how are you going to do that? That's going to be impossible, because who's running Palestine? Palestine is being run by the British, 
it is being run under the so-called mandate system, which means the League of Nations man mandated Palestine, which was Turkish territory mm -hmm. before that, uh, to be a uh, Jewish homeland. But there were rules in place. And the rules, and this is important, the rules were that Jews could not enter Palestine right. without $5,000 in cash or 1,000 uh, British pounds. And this was called the so-called Capitalist Immigration Certificate. Now, how does a Jew leave Nazi Germany, where there are currency restrictions, where no one can bring a Reichmark out of Germany, how does that Jew get into Palestine as a so-called official refugee? The answer is, the Germans concocted the idea, and the Zionists concocted it with them, that German goods would be sold. And as German goods were sold, money would be produced. A Jew in Germany, in this complex arrangement, would take his personal household possessions and assets and put them in a special bank. Mm -hmm. And that bank was called Pal Troy. Then a second bank was set up called the Anglo-Palestine Bank, and that bank was in Palestine. The money would be put into the German bank. The Nazi goods would be sold by the Zionist organization across the Middle East, and especially in Palestine. When the goods were sold, they generated revenue, when, which went into the Anglo-Palestine Bank. The Anglo-Palestine Bank then provided the money for the Jews to bypass the currency restriction that the British had imposed, and they would come in. In the process, the Nazis could restore their economy. The Nazis could break the boycott, because you could not transfer a Jew <coughs> by selling the goods, and at the same time boycott the goods. The infrastructure of Jewish Palestine was built up. Pipes, steel, breweries, homes, cars, buses, all of things, these things German made. And I wondered when I first went to Israel, why are there so many Mercedes-Benz running Everybody around? Everybody asked that question. We, we all sure. ask that right. question. Right. And that's where I really start. Well, I, is that what got you interested in, the to in, in this topic? No, what actually got me interested in is, we'll actually get okay. to that in a little bit. It was, a, it was the right, we'll Martians come back to that. in Let's Skokie. stay with what you're talking about. Then. Go ahead. So I wrote this book and explained how it happened. And in the process, 25 years ago, I was the first one to talk about the economic consequences of the Holocaust. Hmm. At that time, people said, why are you talking assets? They were still trying to comprehend the enormity, uh, the scope of the bloodshed. How many people died? How many people were gassed? How many trains were, were there? People were not talking about money. Now, today, that dominates the conversation as assets. I want my property back. I want my insurance back. I want all these things back. Sure. But in those days, it was all almost blasphemous. It was a, a few decades ahead of its time to discuss the money consequences. But I, real, I realized that the scope of the bloodshed was in many ways linked to the economic impact of the Holocaust. In addition, I was the first one to use the word Nazi and Zionist in the same sentence. Mm. Now it is today, everywhere, mm -hmm. especially by the enemies of the Jewish state. But the fact, it, the fact is, at that, at that time, it was completely unexpected. And so that's why the book was extremely controversial. That's why there, uh, the um, media jumped on it. I went on a giant tour, and even though I did my best to convey the information as best as I could, it was quite shocking. And so we have um, uh, people hiring psychologists to go on uh, television and analyze me. Did, did people assume you were saying there was a sense of cooperation between the Nazis and the Zionists, and that was part of what then uh, was so disturbing? Well, Is they were trying saying? to say that um, I was blaming the Jews. Right. For their very own fate, instead That's of right. seeing uh, this whole elaborate scheme and, and in terms of... of in how terms of a rescue. In fact, I had a problem with my own parents, who were survivors from the train to Treblinka and forest fires, who thought that I was perhaps revealing something that should not be revealed. 